Fill her up. You're listening to the Gas Digital Network. Michael Malice here, and let that be your welcome for the next hour. We have with us, by popular demand, that doesn't make sense this is me. one of the first times we've had someone where the audience was like, you got to get this person on, you got to get this person on, uh, Melissa Chen, who's the Managing Director of Ideas Without Borders. And beyond. I'm sorry. Ideas Beyond, Ideas beyond Borders. Well, we'll take that out in post. Um, and in fact, I was doing a live stream last week, and I was talking about having you on. And everyone's like, oh, you mean Lauren Chen? <laughs> and I, I did not mean that. And they kept thinking I was mistaken. But you do great work. But let me just say one more thing. I've been doing this show for a couple of years. Yeah. So of all the many guests we've had, which is over 100, you have been the most difficult to book. And therefore, what? by one objective no, measure, the most annoying. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, and I also was late today, so... Uh, yeah. That's okay. Wait, so tell me about this organization because I can't think of any better way to fight totalitarianism than through knowledge and information. And that is what you guys do. Uh, yes, although our stated end goal is to prevent extremism because extremism is actually a belief system. Terrorism is the uh, actual tactic. Um, totalitarianism is related to that because it's related to um, control, right? It's just governments that are authoritarian tend to also breed extremists uh, within their midst. So the organization's stated goal is to prevent extremism before it takes root, because why wait till you have to de-radicalize someone who's about to commit you know, a, a violent act? You already have these extremist viewpoints that exist. People embrace them. Um, and, and how do you combat that? So the organization is devoted to empowering these vulnerable folks um, through education, like you said, through exposure to different ideas. Um, some of them are just it's not, you know, at least where we live. Like, I think in the West, like, people really take our free access to ideas yes. for granted so much. Yes. So much. Like, at least for us here, if you're ignorant, it's a choice. You made that choice. But for most of the rest of the world, um, it's not a choice. Like, ignorance is kind of the default because either ideas are not available in their language. Um, totalitarian governments censor a lot of material and then there's not just coming from the government but then there's societal yes. censorship which is huge and you're starting to see that a bit here yeah uh, what nations do you do most of your work in so because of my co-founder who is an Iraqi refugee um, and also because that is to quote Bill Maher the uh, you know cluster Pakistan that's what he called yeah. the area um, we focus on Arabic uh, Kurdish and Farsi right now but mostly Arabic um, it has 420 million speakers around the world. Yeah. So you're looking at a huge knowledge deficit, right? Because you have, I think it's um, one less than one percent of the world's global online content is in Arabic, but but it has it's the fifth most spoken language in the world, and in a place where they don't even have the luxury of learning a second language like English, and the content's not available in a way that they can even understand or digest it. What you know? What do you do? Um, I mean, you've been to North Korea. I ha you've never been? It's the new Milan. <laughs> well, probably it's easy for me to go because I still have a Singapore passport and we have diplomatic relations yeah. with North Korea. But no, I've never had any desire to go. Uh, how? Whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, let's take this sidebar. You're telling me you do work with regards to totalitarianism, radicalism, closed-mindedness, and you're not interested in seeing what this looks like in practice? It's uh, like being an oncologist and not going to cancer well, ward. Not, not North Korea. I'm definitely interested in going to the Arab world. Um, in fact, I was just in Tunisia, but that's that's the, the old first. that's yeah. the old Milan. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, but but North Korea. I mean, the government said I've sort of been on record, kind of criticizing too much, which is China, North Korea. I don't really dare to go to right now. You'd be fine. Yeah. They only go after their own. Really. Yeah. Because uh, you're like an animal to them in many ways, and I. I treat my animals well, so. Yeah, but you don't. Ex right, you're not going to punish your. You're not going to shoot an animal for peeing on the floor, right? So if you're acting inappropriately, you're not 
it's they can't expect anything from you because you don't know better. Right. Whereas if you're a North Korean and you're betraying the Kim dynasty, then there's retribution because you are a Korean and that holds you at a certain level. I'm just surprised that there isn't an interest because um, when you see what it's like, it, it, it's impossible to describe in words, though I've certainly tried in my work. Right, yeah, I and got it, that from Yeah, you. it changes you uh, very profoundly. And this is the most uh, censored country in the world. This is the most closed society in the world. This is the most... And the thing is, I've met refugees, and I've told these stories how y you talk about ideas and you know people don't access ideas. A lot of times we pick up ideas, even in the West, and then you grow up and you don't realize these were lies because you've never in a position to question them. And I'll give you a very easy example. Yeah. When I was a kid, this is a silly one, I had a week when I was into washing dishes, right? I, like five years old, I thought it was cool. I don't understand why. And my mom said to me, make sure you rinse that off really well because otherwise you get sick from the dishwashing liquid. Okay. And I never questioned that. And then my friend was at my house and she was washing the dish because she ate it. And she, I go, oh, make sure you wash that off. Or else it's like poisonous and she stops. And she looks at me and she goes, don't you think of all the technology, this is the one thing you wouldn't make poisonous? And I just had no answer. I was like, oh my God, my mom had no memory of this. My point being in North Korea, there's so many ideas that are promulgated with these people that w even when they come to the West, you know, they'll say things and right. I'm like, this is ridiculous. And like, I never even questioned it. So I'm just shocked that there's not an interest on your part to see, you know, it's not the Arab world, but people who are have even worse. Talk uh, about extremism. Well, yeah, but so I guess I, we've interviewed a lot of former extremists and, and it's pretty difficult to hear because the reason why we actually do that is because we're trying to figure out, okay, what did it take for you to yeah. radicalize, right? So we're trying to understand if you have enough data points and that and you can kind of reverse engineer and figure out like, okay, maybe the maybe it's this particular book or maybe it was this course or this theme of ideas, right? Um, so we're always trying to figure out like, okay, what was it for this person? And accumulate certain ideas and, and then reverse engineer from there. So I'm interested in extremism. It's just what scares me about, I guess, my part of the world is, which is Asia. Obviously, yeah. I grew up in Singapore. Um, is is just it's more personal, I suppose. Okay. Um, I'm I'm able to be far more detached when it comes to studying or or you know doing work with uh, the Middle East. But when it comes to my part of the world, I, I I've probably been a far more passionate tweeter and. Um, sort of been more angry my tweets less careful about it I don't know but I I know I'm on the radar you know in uh, definitely in China I pulled out of a, a, a speaking gig over there recently um, and also because as you know I don't think the Singapore government will negotiate for me it's not a US citizenship sure well actually that's a good point because if you're gonna go to North Korea you have to go through China so if you're on China's radar screen there's absolutely no way you could go to North Korea yeah. um, I, 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 and I that does make a point it's one of the reasons why I feel I have to be the one advocating for North Korea is because if people who look like you are intelligent saying is Americans have the subtle racism it's like okay it's them over there right right but when someone who looks like right. me is talking about it all of a sudden and this is unfair your but own right yeah. right so it, it, yeah. it does make a difference so tell me this is fascinating what are the these steps that de-radicalize people and a lot of these um, mindsets yeah. they warn you they're like okay you know don't read these books this is gonna lead you down to decadence so they are already prepared not to trust things so it, exactly. it's, it's, there's, it's a very it's like a finger trap it is and also you know my uh, co-founder Faisal he grew up under Saddam Hussein right and he has a story where he didn't even know the, uh, what the outcome of the Kuwait war was until Saddam fell like what they tell them in school is are total lies, right? And and dictators tend to do that. They they build up themselves. They they build up very nationalistic ideas that are complete bollocks. And until the U.S. came in, he had no idea who won that war. Um, you know, he thought uh, they were taught that either the the Jews were responsible for 9/11. Oh. or I can, I can confirm this. Right. Exactly. <laughs> oh. um, so that's that's how. Dictators have always done things, and and they tend to co-opt religion as well, which just only reinforces the the control mechanism, right. right? So, I mean, you don't need religion to do that. Obviously, look at China right, right. now; it's a perfect example of that. Um, but you know, the 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 reason why we decided to do this was honestly sheer sheer need, and historically you know if you think about the historical context of this there was a time when there was an islamic golden age right oh like yeah sometime during the 9th to the 13th century there were libraries um in all in like timbuktu in cairo 
in Damascus, and the one in Baghdad was called the House of Wisdom. And that was the Abbasid Empire. Um, they were very open to ideas, uh, very pluralistic at the same time, which I think is, is not coincidental. You know, people that yes. are uh, empires or, or, or places where, are, where they are very open-minded to ideas, you also have, and, and free speech and free expression, they tend to also be the places with the best human rights records. This is not a coincidence. And, and during that time in the Abbasid Empire, they, they built these libraries, but they were, you know, meant for scholars. But they came from all around the world, and they translated the Greek canon into then the language of the empire, which stretched as far as Spain, into Arabic. And what did they develop? They developed astronomy, you know, algebra, algorithms, like all these words that today are like vestigious in our language that, that, that were derived from Arabic. And ever since the Mongols sacked, you know, the empire, it's never, it's never really bounced back. Um, today, I talked to a lot of publishers around in the country because they're trying to get you know, negotiate for the publishing rights, Arabic publishing rights for certain books, right? And they tell me that a bestseller in the Middle East, uh, 5,000 books a year. To be on the New York Times bestseller, it's 9,000 books in a week, yeah. in the first week that you release your book. So, you know, this is the disparity that we're dealing with. Um, more books are translated between English and Spanish within one year than English and Arabic in a thousand years. So what it's telling us is that this flow of information, that there's a huge deficit. There's a knowledge gap. And then you look at online, Wikipedia, that's one of the things that we're doing. It's actually translating the 10, only 10% 10 of all of English Wikipedia is in Arabic, right? So we're trying to push that up. Like what about the word, like say, Orwellian or George Orwell, he didn't have a page in Arabic. Wow. So do you even know what the concept of Orwellian is if George Orwell doesn't exist in your language in a way that you can understand? There's no concept, right? So uh, women's rights, for example, there was no information on that if you look at Wikipedia. Um, so since we started that project, which is about six months ago, we've kind of moved that needle. Now it's, it was 10% of Wikipedia into Arabic. Now it was, it's 12 so it's very slow, but it's happening. And and the we finally got on the radar of the Muslim Brotherhood, oh, which great. is interesting. Uh, they wrote a hit piece on uh, one of our translators in particular, but targeting the work that we were doing um, with regard to evolutionary biology articles on Wikipedia. So for some reason, um, this goes against doctrine or whatever theology. And I, I guess it's not unlike evangelical yeah, Christians, course, frankly. Yeah. So we did actually all the evolution by uh, articles. All of them were translated in Arabic by a couple by our team. And I guess we raised the heckles of uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, and they wrote a hit piece. They they said um, uh, they put him on not only just put him on the list, which we're kind of concerned about, but but they wrote a whole article refuting it, um, saying that this organization is writing bad ideas, blah blah blah, and. Uh, if you look at the recommended articles at the bottom, you would see that, oh, how to scientifically cure homosexuality. Like these were the articles that they were recommending, you know, to read in lieu of the stuff we were publishing. So this is very much a, a, a battle for ideas. We're lucky that the, their efforts to flag our content for Wikipedia to take down, of course, Wikipedia didn't. Right. Um, but, you know, it's, there's a lot of resistance. Isn't there also a huge literacy gap uh, in the Middle East, like the, the liter illiteracy rates are pretty high. It really varies by country. So like the Gulf region, is, it's really high, uh, high low illiteracy, okay. illiteracy, high literacy, but low illiteracy. It really varies by region. So if you look at like Tunisia, it's high. Um, then you have countries like Yemen, like Syria, especially now, it's low, right? And especially after war, um, of course. I know Egypt, after the revolution, for example, too, is, is struggling a lot. But... Um, you know, that's one of the reasons why you have to bring people's ideas to the language that they can understand and can speak. So beyond just books, how about audiobooks, right? So a lot of the books that we've translated, Steven Pinker's Enlightenment Now, for example, we're going to do it in audiobook format. We're going to do it in, uh, so we actually, we have already done this. It's already on our library site where you can watch a two minute video in Arabic summarizing all of Steven Pinker's books. So now you don't actually have to read. It's not just written content. You have videos you have you know and, and it engages a certain segment of the population that's like younger perhaps get them when they're young and if you think about like 
I mean, you know, just people in general. Like out of a hundred people that will watch a video, maybe twenty percent of that would be interested to even look at the book. Mm -hmm. Out of that, maybe ten percent would download the book and read completely. You know, and it's a very thick book. So we're trying to use. I mean, we might as well make use of digital media. It's here, and and it captures attentions like you know books never really did. So we have to adapt, and that's why we named the whole program after that library in Baghdad、it、was called the House of Wisdom, but we called it the House of Wisdom 2.0 because we wanted to sort of emphasize that this was completely a digital effort. And going digital also helps us to elude censors. So you can, you know, like let's say you're reading like on Kindle or something. You're a housewife in Saudi Arabia. You don't want your husband to know what you're reading, illicit material, a subversive material you're reading, and Uh, of course, what counts as subversive is, is nothing right. there, right? It's death penalty, I think, for atheism.、Um, so, it's you can sneak by and sort of like just open up your mind slowly, rather than like worry about like, oh, what if I got caught with this book? You know, which is hard evidence that you are already going down the rabbit hole of expanding your horizons. Yeah, that's that's what's happened in North Korea as well. That instead of it's, now it's gone to down to memory sticks. And it's a lot easier to hide a memory stick than it is to hide a book, than a DVD. You know, you gotta have the eject,、yeah. and then you just pull it. And, you know, so the technology is such. I, I talk about this all the time. Such a great mechanism to spread ideas, and such a great. You don't have to argue with the state or with these organizations. Like, you want to kill us, you want to censor us. That's cool. Yeah. We're not gonna change your mind. We're just gonna slip this guy this memory stick, and you can blather all you want, but we're gonna do what needs to be done. Have you seen that program done by the Human Rights Foundation, the flash drives for freedom? Yeah. Yeah. So they would send the memory sticks. They they would ask you to load movies, whatever it is, like just things that were created here,、uh, especially pop culture stuff, and just like send them in via weather balloons、right. into North Korea. It's a lot easier to say. If it's just like political books, that this is all lies and propaganda, right? And there, and you could, if I were a North Korean or or someone in Egypt or something, you, you would actually believe that because like, okay, this is all one perspective. But if you're sending like Michael Jackson videos and Titanic and like Seinfeld, it's very hard to look at that and think, okay, this is all, you know, the U.S. imperialists trying to ruin our way of life. Right. Like it, if if the tone is so clear. And so different, and that's such a great effect. So, what were the actual steps that some of these former extremists took to become de-radicalized? It really varies. Okay. But it it always starts with research. Like they always go through this phase where where there's something that just plants a seed of doubt, and and in some cases it was、um, studying comparative religions. Like wait a minute, there's a competing idea, and、right. they also claim to be. Um, the truth, right? And these truths are are they're in a zero sum contest.、So、they they they're mutually exclusive. And、uh, so some for some people it's it's that method.、Um, other cases it's science. Like they started questioning, you know, the extremists that that recruited them or something. And and they they realized that certain ideas were like a no go zone. And that always, like I think, in some people, and I suspect this is kind of wired in us, when you're told, yeah, you know, wet paint, do not like, uh, you just have to like. For me, it's、uh, like one example is chewing gum. Like I couldn't have chewing gum growing up because it was banned for inexplicable reason. And、uh, sorry, I always have chewing gum. Just it's always there. Get the cane. What? Get the cane. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna cane her. Oh. oh. <laughs> Twelve, by the way. Is it twelve? Okay. Poor guy, who ended up being a felon anyway、oh. when he came back. So, so it's good、yeah. that he got caned. No, <laughs> I would never justify it that way. <laughs> but but that was the narrative. Yeah. That was, see, yeah. I, we told you he was a Jew, like a juvenile delinquent, and he was, he deserved jail and caning and capital punishment. What is the one book that you have found in your work that's been most effective at de-radicalizing people in the Middle East? Um, not necessarily de-radicalizing, but we we can track、uh, based on downloads, right? So we 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 know exactly uh, what um, people are downloading and what's what's high in demand there. So、uh, it turns out that the ideas that are the most、um, radical are also the ones that are most taboo. So the God Delusion, for example, by Richard Dawkins,、um, was actually apparently downloaded. 14 million times in Saudi Arabia alone. It's amazing. 
All right, and that's in a place where um, it's uh, the penalty is death yeah. for for atheism, a uh, wrong think, and uh, it's been downloaded 14 million times. That's pretty scary well, and the thing is it, it's not even a function of convincing someone to be an atheist no it's a function no, no, of no. convincing someone to be a critical thinker correct that's it and and you could you could have as much religion as you want but now you have a different mindset and way of interacting exactly. with knowledge and then the facts exactly michael miles here i want to take a second to tell you guys about something that you will all love the men at least or the ladies or women i should say who listen to this show blue chew if you go to bluechew.com and use promo code malice you just pay $5 in shipping. $5 for a foot long. B-L-U-Chew.com. What's Blue Chew? It's the chewables that is cheaper than Viagra or Cialis with the same active ingredients. It offers men a performance enhancement for the bedroom. Here's how it works. You go to bluechew.com, promo code MALICE. You connect with a physician online. You get prescribed online quickly. You don't gotta go to a doctor. You don't have awkward conversation. You have to, don't wait in line in a pharmacy. It's shipped directly to your door in discreet packaging and prescribed online by a doctor made in the USA. Their slogan is chew it and do it. I endorse the product, I do not endorse this slogan. If you go to bluechew.com, B-L-U-C-H-E-W.com, promo code MALICE, only costs you $5 for shipping. I want to take a second to tell you guys about BetterHelp. If you go to betterhelp.com slash malice, you get 10% off your first month. What's BetterHelp? BetterHelp is online counseling. So if there's something interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals, they offer licensed professional counselors who specialize in issues like depression, stress, anxiety, relationships, or the fact that you're so ugly. BetterHelp lets you connect with a professional counselor in a safe, private, online environment. Anything you share is confidential, and it's secret. It's convenient. Why did I say secret? You can now get help at your own pace and at your own time. If you go to betterhelp.com slash malice, you get 10% off your first month. You don't like your therapist? Kick him to the curb. You can request a new one at any time at no additional charge. With BetterHelp, you can schedule secure video, or phone sessions, you get chat sessions, you can even text with them. Go to betterhelp.com slash malice, you fill out a questionnaire, help, it helps them assess your needs and get matched with a professional counselor that you will love. Just like you love getting back to the show. But let's talk um, a little bit about Singapore because my friend who is pretty far right moved there and he thinks it's- Loves it. Loves it. Yeah. Because even though it is liberal market-wise, it is, in many ways, authoritarian. Social. Yeah, and social. It is, if you had to build a city based on the philosophy of Thomas Hobbes, yeah. you would come out with Singapore. Uh, Leviathan was written about this country, right? Um, so the founder of Singapore basically did not trust human nature. He had a very bleak view of human nature. If, if men were left to themselves, which is kind of, for you as an anarchist, just totally the opposite view of life, right? No. That's my view of life. Okay, so, but, so y but you stop there. So if people cannot, I don't know, people are just assholes to each other all the time and they cannot be trusted. Human nature is just shitty. Well, that's why you don't centralize power in one human and you decentralize it so that no one has the ability to kind of impose it on everyone. But, but the solution that, that uh, Hobbes came up with was- Well, I don't agree with Hobbes' solution, okay, but I agree correct, with his, his worldview okay. in many yes. ways. Yeah. All right, okay, interesting. Uh, you know, yeah. at, the, at, at the very least, I'm sorry to interrupt you, uh, the oh. worldview is, what are you going to do about the assholes? Like, that's issue number one. There's always going to be some Correct. evil people, as opposed to, like, thinking we're all going to get along. Fine, what about people who don't get along? Like, that's the big concern. I agree most people aren't going to be murderers. What do you do with the murderers? And, and the answer is, don't give them a government to, you know, take over the world. Yeah, well, Hobbes' solution was Leviathan. Right. Right. Uh, sort of uh, an authority you couldn't question to sort of lead the people um, that form the basis of social contract and and it was necessary. So in, in Singapore's case, I, you know, unlike many other countries, no blood was shed. Like they never, if you disagree with the government, uh, they, they never killed anyone or, you know, so it's not that kind of country. Um, you cannot classify it as a, 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 a dictatorship in the same way that you would other regimes. Right. Um, it's a very strong rule of law situation. So they would use 
law to either, you know, make life difficult for um, its dissidents, which, you know, you're still alive, but it's just difficult. Sure. But the boundaries are very clear, too. So I can understand why people on the right really like this because it's such such a rule of law country. Um, it's basically all the policies and principles are predicated on people respond to incentives. Yes. So it's very pragmatic. Right. So you're not optimizing for liberty because optimizing for liberty does not give you well-being. And it's an interesting social experiment because, you know, people always ask me, um, are you, uh, you know, like what, what exactly is your politics? And I say, like, I, I think it's informed so much by obviously, you know, experience growing up, your experience growing up in the Soviet Union, yeah. you know, informed your perspective of the world. Um, in my case, Singapore is a, it's an interesting mix of both socialist and capitalist policies. Yeah. In many ways, very low taxes. So your far right friend loves the, the economic, you know, the fiscal austerity. Almost no welfare in how it's counted by the West. But it's a kind of welfare because even though you don't um, have like typical government handouts like food stamps and things like that, what you do have is the government building sort of apartment housing for and subsidizing it for, for people. So 80% of the country lives in public housing. So don't tell me this is the neoliberal right. you know, utopia that you thought it was. It's, it's, it's a mix. Um, and whatever worked, the theory was that if you gave people housing, if you gave people ownership of a place to live, they wouldn't feel like they had anything to lose. So they wouldn't be out on the streets. They wouldn't protest. So everything about Singapore was just how do you create political stability, minimize chaos, and in a place that four different racial groups with different religions that are often antagonistic outside of the context, Muslims, uh, Christians, Buddhists, that anywhere else in Southeast Asia are currently fighting, and they were able to create this you know, place where they can all coexist very harmoniously. It, it's saying something about the results. Um, I'm a huge critic of its free lack of free expression. Yeah. In fact, the um, uh, Reporters Without Borders actually ranks Singapore 158th out of 170. Wow. So it's below Russia, Afghanistan, um, on the Freedom of the Press Index. So it's, yeah, people kind of don't care or ignore that because, you know, it's, a, it's prosperous, high GDP per capita. So we'll, you know... We'll ignore it. Yeah, it's it's as my friend described it. It's almost like if a corporation made a country. You exactly. know, in some ways, it's like Gattaca, almost or something. So it's everything's very clean. The trains do run on time. I yeah. uh, heard that before. Yeah, <laughs> but this time it's true. Mussolini's trains did not run on time. That oh, was a really? big myth. Yeah, wow. yeah. So the how did that spread? That's so weird. Because it's all, same. It's, it's, look at this. Say you get an idea and then you never and question, question it, it. Yeah. because the, all these dictatorships, their big Mussolini, his big propaganda was. It's not going to be like the Soviet Union, right, which is totalitarian. Mm -hmm. We have freedom, free markets. Okay. It's not going to be like a capitalist America, which is failed, which is a big corporation. We have everything working together. And look, it's efficient. The trains run on time. Everyone's happy. It was a lie. Uh, but, and this is something that at many, um, yeah, yeah, many Westerners at the time, you know, there's that song, You're the Top, You're Mussolini. He was, before he was besties with Hitler, was regarded as like, this guy's got it figured out because he had the best of both worlds and he was regarded as the moderate. They called it the third way. He was like looked at like a Giuliani figure. What? Yeah. You did not know this? No, There's I a great not. book called Mussolini, The View from America, written in the 70s. And it talks about, again, before World War II, he had invented a new kind of government which solved the issues of the Great Depression and solved the issues of the Soviet Union. And it was like, and FDR very heavily emulated him with the NRA, the National uh, what is it, Recovery Act, which set prices. We had, did you know we had marches in the States with the Blue Eagle banner? It was very fascist-like. Yeah, yeah, he was extremely admired in America. That's crazy. No, I did not know yeah, that. Yeah, and then it's like, oh, you sign on with this guy, and it's like, oh, this this is, no, we, we don't like, we, no, 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 no. Like, we liked the first few seasons of this show, and then really it got very bad at the end. Yeah. I, I've had to self-educate on history and philosophy a lot because in Singapore, they don't teach you that stuff. Why? So what do they teach you about like... Uh, um, no, the school system is very much uh, math and science focused. So okay. critical thinking is... I don't, I don't think I knew what the word was huh. at all until I got to college in America. College in America was what like opened my mind um, because it's just a lot of stuff there wasn't taught like that. I went to a Christian school too, so 
even evolutionary biology was not taught. Um, and, and, you know, this is by the time you're 17, 18. Yeah. These ideas are kind of... So it's, it's very personal for me, too, in the sense of the work that I'm doing because I understood what it did for me. Um, but it's, it's just intellectual, I suppose. And then I met my co-founder and, you know, he, his story was just like growing up in, in Iraq and living under b b war and strife constantly and having your best friend killed because you believed the wrong thing or said the wrong thing. And it's just by Al-Qaeda. It's, it, it's sort of confronted to me, uh, it's sort of juxtaposed this like third world, first world problems. Like for me, it was just like, oh, wow, I can't believe I didn't know this. This was the truth. And it was just intellectual, in a way, intellectual masturbation. Um, it didn't really change things that much in my life. It was just, uh, you just awake and become more self-aware. And, and of course, your politics changes. A lot of things change of course. When, when you realize um, either you were indoctrinated in one way or your entire worldview shifts. Like, how many people on earth, you know, have had an the, the, the paradigm of how they thought and saw the world just, like, shift? So you were red-pilled. Or... Uh, is that the word? That's I don't know. the word. That's okay. what that means. That oh, yeah, the original. Yes, yes. Yeah, like yeah. when you realize, holy crap, everything I've been taught is a carefully constructed narrative. Correct. And that, and that is, Correct. I, I mean, you, you, that moment, and you're like, holy crap, I don't know who I am, and I don't know what's real. Right, right. And so, I, I, I mean, it's so unnerving when you go through that process. Yes. Like the first time, it's actually scary, right? You're like, shit, what is real? And, and the extent of things you can start questioning now, it's like, it, you go down the, that that rabbit hole and yeah. you could disappear if you just went too far that's that i always say you take one red pill not the whole bottle <laughs> that's really true but that's what happens once yeah. you go down this like everything's a lie then you're ending up with you know very bad places but it's exactly what you're saying it's actually challenging narratives because we all grow up with narratives whether it's from our family right mom like, my mom's myth was like if you keep crossing your eyes like one day it's going to get stuck or something and i never questioned that. It's kind of stupid now that they might it um and then there's narratives from your teachers, your friends, society around you, your religion, culture. I mean, Confucian culture, oh my gosh, is full of this kind of nonsense. Um, and then governments. So, you know, it's just all these layers and layers of narrative now in. That's one of the reasons why we focus on the Middle East. Yeah. Because, well, it's, a it's the secret sauce. We have the connections to do so there because of my co-founder. But also because um, there their kind of brainwashing is very um, it's very distinct, it's very unique. So it's kind of a similar problem, right? Like um, the, the, the way that, you know, books, for example, are just not uh, commonly distributed there. It's, uh, people are very like, sensitive to, to ideas. That censorship is, is almost just a way of life. Uh, so, and then you, you put onto that the dictatorships, which, which, you know, now institute sort of very draconian measures like Rafe Badawi is still in jail in Saudi Arabia, right? After, I don't know how many times he's been flogged now, but just for blogging, you know, starting a, a secular blog. So it's, it's, I always say like to think about each country's like approach to human rights always ask yourself this question, what is it that I have to do in my country to not be able to go back to that country? So it doesn't take much in some parts of the world. You could just be the wrong minority. You could just be the wrong religious sect if you're Shia versus Sunni. Um, in some cases, like the case, uh, it's say maybe in Bangladesh or Pakistan, it's, I don't know, blasphemy, right? Where blasphemy sure. laws are very um, apparent. Um, they, you just have to, say the wrong thing and the mob comes after you and you're you can't go back to your country what and in the u.s like you have to maybe divulge pentagon secrets for that to qualify sure. so so it's it's kind of a scale and and when we sort of use terms like dictatorships or or you know it kind of condenses everything into one and it's not because some people always ask me like singapore's a dictatorship why aren't you doing anything there i'm like yeah but it's benevolent it's kind of different you know, and and for me, what I would have to do to not be able to return there is a pretty high bar, despite the fact that, yes, it's only been one party in power. So I I prefer to sort of categorize things in, in a more nuanced way when, when approaching these like issues about, you know, where do we need um, knowledge gaps to be plugged? You know, where where we should focus our 
human rights or humanitarian efforts on and you know North Korea is a very good example oh of, yeah of something like that and not many people are doing anything about it I don't think can yeah you don't yeah <laughs> don't, don't care. well I guess you've gotten me started already but yeah I, I mean it's 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 really I think it's getting better very quickly because that's something I'm sure you've seen with your work is uh, there's an asymmetry between facts and truth and lies so if you have a friend who tells you 90 truths and 10 lies you're going to look at them as a liar even though 90 percent of the time they tell the truth right so with north korea especially because it's so removed from reality that it and especially with the younger kids in the 90s there was a big famine where like you yeah. know up to 10 percent of the population starved and once the government's not feeding you then it's a lot harder to be like these guys are great because at the end of the day uh, to use a horrible expression you don't have to believe in anything it's like my kid's hungry and that's just an animal level of like, uh, you know, it, it's not to do the propaganda. So because of these memory sticks and because these, these refugees and so much information and ideas are coming in, it's really causing a problem, thank God, for this worst regime on earth. Um, and and the, many are defecting it if they can, but it's it's dangerous. It's So, this, so people don't realize about um, uh, North Korea is how clever the regime is and they're evil. Uh, and that's like part of uh, this isn't about me, but this is about your work, but just briefly. So they adjust to uh, conditions in order to maintain their dictatorship. So, for example, uh, the border guards are hungry just like everybody else. So what you do is if you live by the Tumen River, you bribe them, you go to China, you do your trade or whatever, you come back. It's kind of like a tax. He, the border guard gets his cigarettes or a cut and you get to go to China and come back. So the government now said you have to turn the people in, but we'll let you keep your bribe. So the border guard's like, oh, I get the money and I turn the people in. So instead of being like, no, you have to, they're like, they're responding to incentives and incentivizing their attack dogs to brutalize the population. That's crazy. So, but that's smart. It is. And that's what I think a lot of people in our uh, Western media, our projection of dictators is that they're all frothing at the mouth morons. And it's like, these people oh, are no, often... No especially China, talk a bit about China because these people are brilliant in maintaining their hold on power and sophisticated. Right. Um, China did not go the way we thought it was going right. to be. It was, you know, like it, we were, we started trading with them. I think it was a, um, in the 90s. We opened up, they joined the WTO and um, we thought, okay, if just a little bit of economic liberalization, the political liberalization will come. That's what we expected. It, it seemed to be the pattern of history. Uh, Fukuyama wrote the end of history and yeah. you know we we seem to have you know the down the fall of the Berlin Wall that just seemed to be the pattern of the world back then and China failed spectacularly they are economically empowered now I mean the difference is back then we actually had some leverage because they were not but now we're in trouble because they are economically empowered they um, they have used technology many a lot of it which you know the world ha the rest of the world has developed to to sort of industrialized surveillance, repression, right. censorship on a scale that's that's terrifying. That, I don't know, like, it's like this is a science fiction dystopia. Yeah. And what they're doing actually even with Xinjiang, mm -hmm. um, it's so hard to get information out of there. What they're doing to the Uyghur Muslims, you know, I don't know if I should use the word concentration camps, but it is being used after what happened to AOC. I don't, you know, that word scares me. Well, um, this is a case where it's appropriate. I think so. But again, information is so hard to come out. Like right. the journalists that have, were covering all of this, I have friends from um, the FT and, and I think now BuzzFeed, they, they've been ejected. They've, they're now in exile. They were doing way too much work down there, you know, and the Chinese government stops at almost nothing, right? So they've kidnapped people, booksellers in Hong Kong, who were half Hong Kong citizens, half Swedish nationals, and they've kidnapped them, and they, we don't know where they are. We, we just don't know. Um, there was a billionaire that, that was kidnapped from the Four Seasons in Hong Kong. Um, and again, we never hear from these people. So it's, it's pretty scary. I mean, some, some people live to tell the tale, a uh, kind of hero bookseller, friend, um, of, uh, a hero of mine is this uh, bookseller who owned a, a shop called Causeway Bay Books in Hong Kong. And what they used to do was um, there were a lot of like secrets that were coming out of the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, you know, infighting, whatever. So, so whenever there was gossip, you know, people who wanted 
inside the party who wanted to get this information out would write write things up in a book, pass them over to Hong Kong, get them published because they could be published there. So very quickly, this particular bookstore became like a, a hub for for inside the Beltway kind of gossip. Yeah, um, it was TMZ, but for the for the CCP, and. And people bought that. Like it was, you know, like people were really interested, right? Especially when you have a black box. The human nature is what's in it. Like of I want to know. Yeah. So, in the end, they obviously raised uh, the red flags of, you know, the Chinese Communist Party, and they they kidnapped five of the owners of the bookstore and the people staff. One of them is the only one who has ever come out to talk about it uh, so far was tortured in prison he was you know just held for eight months he didn't know like in solitary confinement um he's the only one who's ever spoken the rest have just they just don't want to speak about that ordeal they forced them to do signed confessions um and today this man he started his bookstore again but in taiwan so i mean it's I love that spirit. You know what? Yeah, I got defiance. taken down by the state. Yeah, it's defiance. It's kind of like I'm not punk rock and rebellion. Yeah. Do you know who Freddie Lim is? I had him on the show. He was uh, um, He's from Taiwan. He's like one of the party. Le- he he's the head of a rock band, and now he's in their parliament. And you know, he was talking extensively about the Chinese government and their machinations with Taiwan, and how like you know, even with like airports, like it, it doesn't say Taiwan, it says China. Right. You know, things like that. And they're they're and the they, airlines they tried to yeah they right. To they're change. very heavy handed, and that's what I think people in the West don't appreciate is they they have their big stick and they use it. And now they're heavy-handed outside. They're becoming right. more and more heavy-handed to the outside world. Too. Right. They're demanding things. Um, not to mention of their their dealings in, in investments in Africa as well, and you know that part in, in the whole continent. Uh, it's kind of scary the kind of soft power that they're cultivating, uh, making countries dependent on them. They're building infrastructure there. Uh, it's 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 really scary, and they're completely ignoring human rights. Obviously. Not just their own, oh people, yeah, but of course, the Uyghurs and everything. But it's uh, <laughs> I I don't know where this is gonna go. So I am happy on one hand that we are pushing back finally. Um, I think last night's debate, a couple people were asked about the the democratic debate. A couple people asked about what you know what country we should focus on, and uh, there were a few good answers about China. Um, but that's the big threat. It's not Russia right now. I don't think. I think it's China. Yeah, it's, uh, uh, yeah. Let me speak on this because one of the things that N- North Korea innovated is they have a social credit system, right? So based on your loyalty to the regime, it's just like a credit score. It determines where you can live, uh, where you go to school, who you marry. It's it's a it's it's insane, right? And now China has started adopting this, yeah. and they're going to adopt like you can't leave the country, you can't travel internally. So they're going in a social level. We thought they would be more like the West. Maybe let's get them to Russia, even to Russia level. Do you know what I mean? Which isn't great, but it's it's in the right direction. No, no, no. They're going the North Korea direction, and that's when you're talking about over a billion people. That is just so, and given the the brutality of their history, um, that is very, very disturbing indeed. Yeah. No, I I agree. What is the one book that you have found in your work that's been most effective at de-radicalizing people in the Middle East? Um. By far, the articles on Wikipedia, um, we're talking about 4 million, because we track everything now, 4 million views alone on, on, on these tracking pages that we have of like our articles on secularism, um, on articles about like women scientists, for example, which is like for them, it's like, wait, wait, what? Women can be scientists. Um, and uh, yeah, 4 million views, you know, just on these articles alone. So it's fascinating. It. it sounds like a lot of this is counterintuitive. Because if you had sat down, right, and said, these are the articles that we think are going to be most effective, that's not how reality works. No. Like, and you're having proof of concept in terms of, reta- exactly. in terms exactly. of the data. Yeah. And also for Wikipedia, it's organic. So people are just going there. We're not pushing. It's not like a book where we're saying, like, read this, or pushing on our social yeah. media. This is just. Wikipedia is always there. It's just a reference tool. You read about something and you're like, wait a minute, what's that? Then you go to Wikipedia. So something has to point you down that road. The fact that secularism was number one on our list of 
of views of page views in Arabic. That was that was wow. I I was kind of taken away. What's exciting about this is that you and I, and I'm sure everyone listening to this, has gone down a Wikipedia rabbit hole. Oh yeah. And at three in the morning, you're learning about the great Rocky Mountain locust, and now it's extinct, right? It's called. There's a condition. Oh, okay. I actually named it. It's okay. called uh, Wiki ADD. <laughs> and to be successful at it, you have to forget what brought you there in the first place. <laughs> it's it's. <laughs> It's very common, I'm assuming, because yeah. it just links to from one thing to the other, right? But that's and what's fascinating with the, with these types. Their entire worldview is unraveling, and it's not like you're sitting in down lecturing them because maybe you're a propagandist. You're you're going down the rabbit hole yourself. No one's guiding you. Right. Exactly. So you know it's going to be probably true because no one is over your shoulder like they used to in your real life. Exactly. It, you you're free to just explore. You're like, whoa, what is this? And you can just imagine how this unfolds for somebody whose mind has been closed for so long. Today's episode is brought to you by Wix, which is the best and easiest place to create a professional website. All y'all on the internet saying if you don't like it, make your own Twitter. Well, if you had said a few years ago, if you don't like it, make your own website. Well, now you can. It's easy. If you go to letthatbeyourwelcome.com, we used Wix to make the site for the show. And it looks pretty good, I think. And if you don't like it, that's cool. You can make your own site easily. If you know how to use uh, Photoshop, you know how to use Wix. If you don't know how to use Photoshop, dummy, you can use their ADI, Artificial Design Intelligence. You answer a few simple questions and Wix creates a stunning website for you. If you go to the link at the bottom of letthatbeyourwelcome.com, Wix will give you 10% off any premium plan. That's not bad. You can start building your website for free today by going to Wix.com. You're missing out on potential clients and customers if people can only contact you with social media. You guys match someone on Tinder. You guys get a job interview. The first thing they're going to do is Google you. You want the first thing to be the website, your domain name that they can see even if it's just a landing page or something simple. Go to letthatbeyourwelcome.com using Wix and you can see how easy it was to do. Let's get back to the show. So one of the things that kind of messes with my head with my work is meeting these refugees and seeing how normal they are and almost boring. And then you hear their stories and how disturbing it is because this disconnect, because it's like, Part of us wants to think that these people are all screwed. And it's like, no, 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 they're vapid, just like everybody else. And that makes them more human and that makes it even scarier. Um, and I'm sure you know a lot of people who have escaped, but their stories are so insane. Like on a personal level, how do you talk to them and not like lose your mind? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, no, I, I mean, firstly, my, that's how I met my, my co-founder when I first met him. I, we were, I was in graduate school and he had come to give a talk. He was talking about the geopolitics of the Middle East. And I did not even know anything about his story until maybe a few months later. He's kind of like, he doesn't want to be known for his story. So he doesn't talk about it that much. But when I found out just about, you know, what it was like growing up there, how he escaped, how he almost got killed twice, brother was dead. Um, that was, it was, so, it was difficult to hear. Um, and you're, and I'm like, wait, this normal guy that I've been right. having falafels and drinking, you know, like tequila with, has gone through all of that. Um, one of the things that he use he uses is is a lot of dark humor. Yes. Know? And that's a coping mechanism, and it's also the thing that kind of bonded us. Because um, I think like people really react to tra- that kind of trauma uh, in different ways. I've dealt with, like you said, so many refugees. Um, actually, recently was very minorly involved in a case where an Egyptian atheist, a gay atheist man who had sort of outed himself on national TV. Ooh. Two years, uh, it was a two year sort of journey in the making, but he made it to Germany. He made it to Germany for asylum just a month ago. Good. So, you know, that taste of freedom, that story about like what it was like to be completely trampled up upon and then sort of see that light and, and feel that sunlight on your skin it gives it gives me the shivers it really does and again it's it's extremists are very different former extremists especially are very different from um from refugees for them it's purely mind issues yeah you know like they were once suckered down this path and right. it's a spectrum uh you you know if you if you see extremism as like from i don't know normal person to al-qaeda you have to hold a series of 
increasingly puritanical fundamentalist ideas before you get to a point, you know, and again, the spectrum is us versus them. Right. And the question is, what do you want to do to them? Is the success of us um, in direct competition with the hostility to them to the point where they have to be eradicated? They have to be killed. Um, and that spectrum, you know, people sort of, the hard part is dealing with the ones who already are at 9 or 10. And, yeah. and you're trying to deconvert them and de-radicalize them. Uh, their stories are, are harrowing. I mean, in some cases, like former extremists that, that we've interviewed, um, you know, they, they kind of end, end, end up jumping from one ideology to another. So this was not their first extremist foray. Right. You know, they, they used to be uh, extremist Marxists, and then they discover something else, and, and they, they go down that path. Um, I'm not sure, in, in, you know, in that case, what, what it takes to break out of an extremist personality. Yeah. Right. Uh, if if there is such a thing, but one thing we know is that bombarding people with very different ideas, challenging their their narrative, because it's really about just that first seed of doubt. Like, wait a minute, what if what I think it's epistemic humility, right? How do you induce that? And and all you need, and people come to it from very different ways. I always say that like um, extremism is kind of like cancer. It has one pathology, but it has different etiologies. Yeah. So it's different ways to get there, but the pathology is the same. And, and this is very much the case for, for extremist thought as well. Um, and our library, you know, we're basically making up for information that, uh, already published. We, you and I have access to it. They just don't. And they don't have it in a language that they can read and understand or in a format that is easily digestible yeah, yeah. so let's just make that available it's kind of bottom up it's not top down and uh you know you can't you we can't just march into a country and and say we're going to bring you freedom we're going to bring you you know liberal democracy and expect people to just take to it right there's there's too much complicating things too many complicating factors and they've been warned about you <laughs> they've, yeah, they've in been a sense, brainwashed yeah, already. They've been warned that you that they want to come in and destroy our way of life. Exactly. And it's true. So they don't trust you. In a sense, you. yeah. So of course you're up to no good. Yeah. They don't trust you. And so if you don't educate and sort of, you know, give people a reason to believe that liberal democracy is something to be cherished and make them want it in a way, then of course we saw the results in Iraq. Of course we saw, you know, the results after the Arab Spring in, in Egypt. Um, you you need to do something about changing mindsets before the culture of liberal democracy can actually take root. I think that was what was missing this whole time. But it's a long, very long process. And given the difficulties now that I'm actually doing it, right? I'm actually running, the, running things and like trying to go, negotiate for, for rights, making sure we're legal here, um, publishing these books, getting con authors to sign contracts. I now understand why this wasn't done before. It's... it's uh, it's really a huge quagmire legally, logistically. I mean, we're coordinating about 120 translators across the Middle East. Also, we see that as economic empowerment. So if you yeah. are, if you, you know, in Egypt, the salaries are pretty low, but if you are technical and you can speak both English and Arabic, you can make a bit of extra money just translating our books. We pay these people um, and it does a lot of wonders, but we, we want to create something a bit more than just that. How about a movement? Make them proud. Make them proud of like restoring, you know, the the golden age. And it's a bit, you know, we're we're veering there into like make Mina great again territory. But they need something like that to believe that they're a part of something bigger. Because that's how you make a movement stick, right? It's not just like all right, let's just disparately put out one book here, put out one article there. But they must be proud of of being part of these uh, a group that's that's restoring something glory to to you know their people and and improving the outcomes I and mean, it's not just it's not just you know extremism right i mean you can think of like scientific output the more and more people are educated in the right way um the more they will be innovative like a lot of other things will will come from from just from just these ideas kind of taking root or the ideas that ideas should be tolerated is enough, I think, for to take you know to change minds there. One of the big issues when dealing with radicals is that there is a sense of pride 
in holding on to your ideas in defiance of the evidence. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like a good analog for some people would be like people with eating disorders. Like if you have anorexia, you want to have that plate of food in front of you. So you have that willpower and be like, I'm hungry, but I'm not going to eat this. This is kind of the pathology. And the same thing here. It's like the more certain your kind of ideology is removed from reality, the more it shows your strength and commitment when you're given contrary data or contrary narratives to be like, I don't care. I'm holding firm to my position. Is this something that you've kind of encountered when talking to these types? Yeah, it is actually for the most part. It's 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 so they they tend to be so 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 sure about what they believe right and a big part of it is not just intellectual it's also their social identity yeah that's really related to how they see themselves as well um and and that's the that's also the harder part to crack right because identity is something that's very personal um but you know the the things that we can do to sort of help the situation is, I think, getting sort of getting books that are targeted at a much earlier age. So before we even start, I, I think you ossify as you get older sure. in terms of identity and like once you have friends and you start, you know, in, in terms of groups. But also biologically, the brain at a certain point starts. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. But we, but the the complications of friendships and 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 how we see ourselves in social context really. It, it becomes more salient, say, past puberty. Um, and if you, you know, like one of the recent books that we did was uh, I Wonder by Annika Harris, Sam Harris's wife. Uh, we decided to do her book because the book s- central thesis was, you know, it's okay to say, I don't know. It's okay as a child or yeah. even as a parent. It, it's also targeted parents that when your child asks you questions that you can't answer, it's okay to say, no idea. Yeah. Um, let's wonder about it. Let's talk about it together, but I don't know the final answer. Um, and I think just kind of, you know, targeting the youth is, is always before, before they start forming these like social relationships. Um, you know, we're talking about like in the UK, a lot of the radical, like people start radicalizing usually when they're teenagers and they meet other, you know, gangs on the streets and things like that and you, know, you remember what it was like to be 14 15 i was uh, in a gang searching i was for... a badass yeah <laughs> i stabbed all these old ladies for no reason <laughs> and uh, i mean that was majit majit nawaz's story right who? like majit nawaz who's that he's a former extremist oh who was jailed in uh egypt he stabbed old and ladies no he, he didn't stab See, in fact somebody stabbed him he's a poser i'm not i he stabbed stab the old him. ladies but uh, he's a former extremist and, and a, now an anti-extremist yeah. advocate. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting to hear just like what were the factors that lead somebody, somebody down that point. And, and he ended up recruiting for a terrorist group in Egypt, I think, and ended up getting jailed there. But at, and then what de-radicalized him was in jail, Amnesty International bailed him out and, and he, you know, went through this process where like wait a minute like you know i i, I was preaching against them and now they helped me to, yeah now and they no, helped no one me. else did yeah exactly so that this is the kind of stories that we we collect because it, it informs us what we need to do yeah um so you know it's an engineering problem it really is it really is and um the sort of bottom-up stuff that we do which is you know books wikipedia articles Trans, uh, making the books into video, making the books into, into audio books. That's just one aspect. Now, how about top down? Can you do it you know, through education um, in the schools? So one of the things that we started doing was the University of Mosul, um, the University of Anbar. These are former ISIS strongholds. ISIS blew up their you know, universities, but you know, some of it still stands. And now society is just starting to trundle along. It's getting started again. And in these post-ISIS territories, there's a void. And we've decided, you know, this is something that we want to do now. So we're not just putting all our books um, into these universities, like uploading them into their internet for free so they can access our library. But we're also trying to bridge the gap. Um, Courses in the US on rational thought, critical thinking, for example, we're trying to modularize these courses, like university level courses. translate them into Arabic, and now bring that into these universities that 
you know, our, our sort of, we need to be built ideological resistance, resilience in this part of the, in, especially post-ISIS territories. And that's kind of what we're doing with, you know, bridging that gap between content that you can get in the West and making them available as a course that can be taught. Obviously, the concern is just that, you know, do you have qualified people to teach? But if you look at the success of Khan Academy and, and, and online, you know, educational platforms, you don't really need that anymore. Like if you structure content in such a way that um, it's digestible, it's easy to understand, um, it makes sense pedagogically, I think uh, I think it'll go really far. Um, I can see why everyone recommended you do this show because I am such a fan of people who, there's two approaches, sit here and write articles and no one does anything or like I'm going to go to where the issue is and I'm going to figure out what's most effective at low cost, high output in terms of producing change. So I, I, I think this is just absolutely terrific. And I Thank just you. love it when people are, instead of twiddling their thumbs, or this is like the opposite of virtue signaling. You know, you're not even talking a big game. You're like, no, no, we, we have our work and we're actually producing content and it's going to revolutionize things. In fact, the article stuff is becoming more and more uh, antagonistic to, to this effort. You know, like uh, if I'm too concerned about. Uh, for example, I, if I'm too concerned about what's right and discussing things in this like world of ideas here on Twitter, um, I, I could get in trouble in a yeah. way that's harmful to the organization, right. in a way that's harmful to the work that we're doing. Because you know, at the end of the day, we really have to win hearts and minds. So they have to really trust your intentions here. That really, this is about education on the whole. You're not trying to brainwash them on the other side. Yeah, yeah. You know, you're not just spreading Western imperialism because that is something that that could happen. It, you know, you can see your your enemies, like our ideological enemies, who don't want the same kind of world that we want to live in, trying to ch trying to tell people that in in a way that they turn against you and and all your work. Um, so that's that's a pitfall that it's actively a struggle because I I tend to shoot my mouth off too I kind of like you just you know sometimes make inappropriate jokes or whatever it is and you and wish sometimes you like I me. don't <laughs> actually I don't <laughs> oh shade <laughs> wait, 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 this is what I like what do you mean by that uh well no I I, I think um, you actually built a really interesting life yeah um, and actually, okay, the one thing I do admire is, you don't have to is parse your freedom. Words here. Your freedom. Sure. Uh, but I think I'm more of an institution person. Oh, of course you are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Now I am. And you kind of operate on the outside and like set your life up in such a way that you're, you know, you don't have to kind of be part of some part of a institution and have somebody tell you what you can and cannot so say. So you wouldn't do. rather have the freedom to just always fire off your mouth? You prefer it the way you have it? The, the reason is that, the reason why, is that I think if you don't work with the institutions, change is really difficult. I agree with you, 100%. That's yeah, why. Yeah, I know. You're much better positioned to implement uh, things but than no, I but am. But trust me, my heart, it's a mind-heart struggle. My heart wants what you have. <laughs> my mind is like, don't, don't. Like, the, that's I, a bad idea. It's a dance. Because I remember uh, I was being booked for uh, Stossel and his producers asked another producer, they go, can he do anything other than be funny? And they go, <laughs> can the North Korea guy ever not be funny? And they're like, oh, yeah. But people are very limited in their perceptions. So if someone is humorous, right, humor, a synonym of humor is not serious. So therefore, if someone is humorous, they're not a serious person. They can't be taken seriously. Yeah. And it, I don't think that sometimes this happens on a conscious level, but sometimes it's on an unconscious level and people right. don't even realize the perception of oh, this is a clown. Yeah. Um, and beyond that, like, I don't know, even an Instagram, right? You can look at an Instagram and look at a girl's Instagram and you're like, oh, not serious. So right. It's not serious. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not just humor. It's all these, you know, little things that we, we sort of project. Now, I'm kind of there's something in your background that you've been dishonest about because what? you supposedly went to Harvard, but you haven't mentioned it once. No, so no, I, I did not go to Harvard. Oh, didn't I read that? No, no, I never went to Harvard. Did, I just Googled it. Did I Googled. Google? I did. Okay. Then I take it back. No, I, I mean, so I'm trained as a scientist. Right. Yes. That, that is very okay, much Okay. We're going to cut that out in post. I don't want to look stupid or on my show that I have to. There was some article that said I went to Harvard. It doesn't matter. Is there another Melissa Chen? It's another Melissa oh Chen. Oh, my God. This, this is why I love Asian names. 
because in the world of identity theft, ha, you have no idea which one I am. <laughs> and and also I heard that yeah, I look half like Lauren Chen, so because she's half Asian. Wait, you're not Lauren Chen. <laughs> anyway, look, um, like we've, let's talk. Insult to her. Though. Let's get pedantic for a second. Okay. One of the things I saw you tweeting about was about extremism and being in favor of moderation, right? Yes. Moderation, when I hear moderation, that means having no principles right. and being kind of the worst of all worlds. What does moderation mean to you? So any, again, not all extremists, not, so if you, if you want to be pedantic about, the, about extremism, you can take any idea to be unassailable or, or sort of interpret it to its ext most extreme um, I'm just. La I'm goal. sorry. I can't stop laughing because the Melissa. Now I want to talk to the Melissa Chen who went to Harvard. There, there are probably a few. <laughs> I'm sure there's there several. Are probably a few. <laughs> sorry. Go ahead. That was really funny. Oh my god. <laughs> no. Okay. Um, what were we saying? You're talking about extremism and moderation. Ah, yeah. Um, so, extremi extremism, like, you could be a Janist, for example. Sure. And an extremist Janist is not a threat to society. It's probably a good thing. Right. I mean, Aristotle, his ethics, you know, he, he sort of wrote a lot about how um, and any virtue sort of, anything that is virtuous is, is going to be a moderation of, of the extremes, right? So even extreme generosity could be bad. Sure. Um, and I think for the most part that is true. Uh, but but if you think of like certain ideologies, what happens when you just take it to its logical end conclusion and then build a wall around it such that it cannot, it's fundamental, it, you cannot even question it. Um, that's when it becomes very problematic. Okay. So, no, actually what I distinguish between is moderation as a tactic okay, and centrism as a mindset, as a political approach to the world, which are different. So moderation tends to invoke this, like, you know, you're disingenuous, you're trying to take the average between two right. extremes. Yeah, that's not what I'm, you know, that's, I, I think polarization is an issue, for example. And polarization is the mother of extremism, right? In a very polarized world, it's very easy for extremists to sort of um, take advantage of, of the situation and sort of push people even more and more to extreme ends. You are kind of seeing that here, right? Social media world in the U.S., um, Polarization, a lot of data showing this has never been more uh, apparent and the trends are showing that it's getting more and more polarized out there. I don't think social media is helping. Um, and also I think our cultural habits are feeding that. So it used to be that um, even though we, we were a Republican and I was a Democrat, we ate at the same places, we kind of largely agreed on truth or basis for truth, um, no longer. You know, like there was a study that was done showing that Trump won 70% of the places that had Cracker Barrels, but only 20% of the places that had Whole Foods. Um, for me, coming as an immigrant, I didn't know what I was supposed to like or not like, right? So I was educated in Boston, not yeah. at Harvard though. But, um, and when I got there, I remember once saying to my very privileged roommates, oh yeah, I just, you know, I just went to McDonald's. And they looked at me with this like disgust. Like I just, I don't know, like came out looking like Swamp Thing. Um, like McDonald's, ew, I have not had like a cheeseburger from there since like I was five. My mom would absolutely kill me if I ever had. White people, am so, I right? <laughs> and I was like, wait, I'm not, I, I didn't know that, that eating at McDonald's was just something that an educated East Coast liberal does not do. It's a certain type of educated East Coast Correct. liberal. I mean, this is what I call the evangelical left. It's very, very cultural for them. The politics is almost secondary. And it's very much is, a domesticated tracks, imperialism. Yes, but it tracks with the politics. Of course, I think yes. That's, that's my point. You know, there's a certain set of um, uh, it's 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 we're building now, along with the political silos, cultural silos yes. on top of it, and that's making it harder and harder to find common ground because if we're not eating at the same place, if we're having completely different habits, we're consuming different kinds of media. It, it's how do you bridge that? I think this is the best thing ever. I mean, I'm completely in favor of this. Uh, uh, cultural self-segregation because we've had at least two cultures in this country since the beginning have been attached with thumbtacks and string and staples and there's absolutely no reason for two cultures to kind of be united when you could peacefully divorce but how do you how do you build a common shared vision you for... don't there is no common vision and there never was and the you don't think there ever was no. like even in the 50s and the 60s where 
it seemed like the we, 60s the 60s was the era of complete kind of social unrest do you mean the early 60s no but i mean i mean politically we, there there was a common vision for america in the sense that like we you know there was the cold war and we wanted to win it and there was a common enemy yeah, but I think and there, that were, was a shared vision, there right? were very many apologists for the other side in the Cold War. Um, there was all those movements about denuclearizing the West unilaterally. And what I would, what you regard as this shared vision, I would say is one oppressive ideology completely dominating another. And now that other ideology is finding its grounding. Interesting. Um, so I think it's great what you're talking about, that we are going our separate ways. And I don't understand this need for us to all have a common anything. I guess I don't know. Okay, no, I agree with maybe the need, but to look at these habits and have disdain for them. Uh, so there were two things. One was I, I was outed as somebody that ate, ate at McDonald's, and the second was apparently I, you're not allowed to like WWE. But I had Dolph Ziggler as a guest here. You know what I mean? Like, but I mean, this is the leftism at its worst. This it's a, it's a very insidious form of classism. It is. It, it, it's sort of, yeah, man, it, I think it's, it is manifesting itself as classism in a way. Um, but, but when we become condescending to these attitudes or to these cultural habits and use them as proxies now, like, oh, I guess not one of us. But it's not we, this it's is they. But this is what is becoming extremist. So you see, that's what I mean. Like, it's defining us versus them. And then increasingly, oh, them is who you throw milkshakes at. You know, them is who you... You have these increasingly uh, more and more violent prescriptions about what you should do to them. Um, that is what leads to more and more extremist rhetoric to the point is, oh, all of them should be killed. I, I hear you. And that's the slippery slope thing. And that's one, it is. that's one approach. The other way of looking at it is it used to be much worse. Like Woodrow Wilson was putting people in jail for opposing World War I. Uh, you had wage and price controls. You had entire schools of thought who were just not able to be heard at all in America. And thanks to technology now, these yeah. schools no, of thought are being heard. Some of them are nefarious and reprehensible. Some of them are wrong but interesting. Uh, you know, and you got the whole spectrum. And I think this mindset that you're talking about where the very waspy mindset, who these are the kids who ran all the Ivy Leagues you know, 100 years yeah. ago. This is the food you eat. This is what your wife looks like. This is, you know, what your house looks that's like. True. And the fact that that's been taken away, this is a, this is a direct line from those types to your roommates. Like, ew, because 100 <laughs> years ago, it would have been like, you're dating a Jew? You're dating an Asian? Like, you wouldn't even say Asian. It would be unconscionable for them. That's actually an interesting point, because I think what you're bringing up is, is this issue of fragmentation when you had some sort of cultural homogeneity. Yes. Um, and, and how you prevent that from breeding... Uh, I think, like, for example, sports, right? Sports fans are, are able to live with different tribes, but without getting to a point which is extreme. Like, you know, yeah, Philly fans occasionally burn their city, but that's their <laughs> own. They don't do it to other people. Right. Um, sorry, I really hate Philly fans. <laughs> I guess I'm extremist. But, um, but yeah, no, I, I understand. I see, what, I see what you're trying to say now. Uh, because also in America, like, you know, we're also this culture this fragmentation is also a victim of our media consumption patterns they used to be only like three channels but right th but they were all had the same correct, correct. ideology correct. yeah yeah and they kind of still do um yes but yeah and so when you had more and more entrance into the mix right social media democratized um publishing democratized media in, in, in a way, you know, I see that as something happening alongside what we're doing, which is democratizing knowledge. Yes. Um, it has the same effect, I suppose. But um, I guess the only thing that we really have to be very concerned about is when, when it, at what point it starts breeding extremism and how to combat that. What is the one book that you have found in your work that's been most effective at de-radicalizing people in the Middle East? Um, I would say that The New Right definitely was... Uh, Why is very that? instrumental um, because it um, sort of talks about the craziness of you know the the US and the, the political situation right now and uh, it makes people there very thankful for uh, the situation they have and um, they they just don't want to become us it's just like a warning you know yeah. like just don't be this crazy yeah um, yeah I would say it's the new right do you not think that your former roommate is one I, 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 maybe not her, but someone who she represents. And I, this is gonna maybe this is gonna sound like a joke to you. I'm being dead serious. Yeah. 
you don't think one of the things I talk about in my book is that it's really convenient for us to think that the Nazis were aliens or, or monsters. Whereas they came home and they tickled their babies and they told jokes and they had stomach aches and they are so much closer to us than people would like to think. Same with slave owners. You think that slave owner didn't think a baby was cute? You know what I mean? Yeah. And they go home and whip people and, and have no remorse about it. So for me, people like your roommate who are like, you eat at McDonald's, they don't regard people in like, let's say the rural South as fully human. They are one step away from if something, if they just, if those people vanished, well, it's kind of taking out the trash. Um, I'm just saying it's adjacent. It's adjacent. That's all I, I'm saying. I can see that. I can see. It's just how much contempt yes. you have for the others. Because you can, like, like you know, there's these stupid arguments <laughs> all the time that have become memes almost, like pineapple on pizza. Sure, yeah, exactly. You right. know, like, these are fun. Right. You know, when people are like, delete what, your account. Wait, what's your answer? Pineapple, yes or no? No. You're out, you're out of your okay. mind. Go back to Singapore. But yeah. I also don't eat pork. so. Oh, okay. So th this That's is moose. <laughs> I just don't even have Hawaiian pizza. Okay. Um, and it's not for, it's not because I'm kosher or halal. It's just that I saw the movie Babe in 1995. <laughs> I've never eaten pork since okay. then. Okay, fair. It's just pork. I'm fair. not vegan, okay. just to be clear. Yeah. Um, uh, what were you saying? We're talking about uh, your roommate and, and you know, this kind yeah, of yeah. It's, it's, it's really con contempt, right? So it's it's there's the fun in games like this is my site, my the dress is blue and black, not white and Sure, gold. yeah, yeah. And that's just in good fun. And it's in sports, right? That's how you keep it there. But uh, how you prevent contempt, once you define the other, in very, you know, it's just so tempting. It's just so easy. And then now you have like players uh, with interests to exacerbate this. Um, divide or to exacerbate the contempt because now all you know like you think about like media topics right so something like evergreen college happens with brett weinstein and heather who covered it first it, it wasn't the new york times it took about weeks yeah Fo fox news gave them coverage it's just it, so these interests kind of exacerbate uh the the notion of of this dividing line between us versus them and look how bad they are um and people kind of easily get pushed very easily yeah and I, I mean i saw this tweet from chris hayes this week i don't even remember what the context was but it was vis-a-vis -vis these like refugee camps right that, yeah. that we have and he's just like are the people i don't remember what it was stupid or are they just pretending to be stupid so it could be maybe they're just uh ideologues who are wrong maybe they're smart and you know what i mean yeah. but when you are blithely and yep. publicly uh in, in telling an entire population is stupid that is I mean, talk about slippery slopes. That is one step away from, okay, they're inferior to us. This is the historic racism. They're dumb. Exactly. We're smart. So we they shouldn't have an input. We shouldn't hear them. And then from there, it's you know, you can go in two directions. It it go, it's so it's, once yes. you dehumanize somebody, it's just so easy to take away their rights. Like it's just And it's that and, and feel good about it. Because oh, they're dumb. Moral, yeah. We're smart. It's we have to take care of them because they can't take care of themselves. Right. And then imperial domesticate imperialism, you know, gets locked into place. So this is another reason I'm an anarchist because there it, you talk about epistemic humility. There is this huge sense among people who read the New Yorker, who like I read the New Yorker, some worldly. <laughs> I know what's going on because I read this magazine that no one else knows about, and therefore I'm in a position to basically dictate things to entire regions of a country that never stepped foot in. It, right. it it blows my mind. Right. And, and a lot of our policies have gone south because we did, precisely did that. Yeah. You know, like the, the elite class had, had um, prescriptions based on things that they read. And and, uh, and at the same time, telling people in this country how uh, unfree we are and how under attack we are, which you know, under attack, maybe I can wrap my head around, but like with your work and my work, when you look at how bad things are in the rest of the world, it's, it's mind boggling it what people will say with a straight face. It is, and that w that was one of the biggest, um, a bit of a culture shock for me when I when I came here. It w it was just the kind of concerns that that my my college mates would have, you know, on an everyday basis because they 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 were not privy to just what what the situation was like outside. America is so um, it, it is the center of the world in many ways. Yeah. It, it, and and I think most people don't even have to leave the country to. You know, it's just not necessary. Right. Right. You can see the world in America in a way. It's so much to see in one lifetime, let alone um, two. So I, I understand why that's the case. But 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 we tend to be very insular. And, you know, of course, when I first came here and I was like, Singapore, where is that? Like, oh, in China. That was the first, you know, um, question I always got.
and I, I never saw that as, you know, nowadays would be like, oh, well, I take offense, it's racist. No, it's just, you wouldn't know. I, yeah. I don't know what the capital of Alabama is, uh, Montgomery. You do know, see. Okay, so just guess. Um, did but, your parents quiz you in like geography that. as a kid, like mine did? Yeah, oh, okay. well, yeah, that was my interest too. Oh, okay. I really liked geography. Okay. I was really, again, like Singapore is very insular like the US and I was always curious about what lay beyond. Um, anything, I don't know, I just reject parochial kind of mindset yeah. in general. And that was always my, my thing. All right, Melissa, we're running out of time. Thank you, Michael. What has been your favorite part of the interview? Um, oh, you trying to find out what why I didn't want your life yeah for some reason that was interesting you are welcome <laughs>